market flywheel. So the, first, the ones that come on them are cast iron. You don't want to throw over 3,600 RPM with them. You probably could get away with about 4,000 RPM, but they're very dangerous once you get above that. Uh, I've heard stories where they come apart and you basically got a 22 pound saw blade flying at your neighbor or something. Um, another thing that's important here is if you can see, because I'm getting the RPM up on this, you need to be able to adjust your time, timing on this. So I've got this set at between 31 and 32 degrees for top dead center. Seems to be a real sweet spot for it. Got a good idle. Uh, I idle it at 2,000 RPM uh, because you run through the reduction driver, not spinning the blade very fast. The other thing is um, getting it up off of uh, normal motorcycle idle is you don't have to worry about the circuit and your carburetor for uh, a smooth coming up off the idle. So if you've got a botched landing, you can just punch it and you go because you're already at 2,000 RPM, so it just wraps. Um, let's see, another thing that's important, uh, these things come with what's called a smart spark. And what, what that means, I have no idea. But basically what it is is the same thing as in your, the newer vehicles, you got an RPM limiter. Uh, so besides on the stock carburetors, which has got to go because it's just way too small, and they got a fixed jetting in them. So with airplane use or any kind of change in altitude use, you know, you're going from lean to rich to all kinds of stuff, and you're just not at optimal. Um, if you live at a higher elevation to begin with, then you need to, you know, tune your carburetor with different jetting and that for that altitude. Also, if you're flying super high, you know, you're going to want to make sure that's corrected for you're better rich than lean um, so the little carburetor that comes on these things is just pretty much useless and so that gets stripped off I end up making up these intakes uh, if you look it's just a 6061 t6 aluminum uh, machine them out this is kind of archaic but it it works real good and it's very very sturdy uh, then I mount the Makuni carburetor on here I've tried different types of carburetors I've even had the Solex off a Volkswagen engine on here and it ran great. You know, I had accelerator pumps they could just punch it and it just wrapped. Uh, but these seem to be pretty much a better universal carburetor, very inexpensive, you know, like a hundred bucks or a little over a hundred bucks to get one. Then, time you get intake or your uh, air cleaner and everything else on there, you know, you get less than 150 bucks in the thing. Uh, what else is there? Uh, I went with the older style mags on this. Uh, very very simple all you got is just the one wire so you know it's like any mag once you get it started it'll just keep running until you run out of fuel and then all you're done is hitting your off switch and then um, I've got a key switch just like you do in, on a riding lawnmower so you just hit the switch starts up it's electric start very important electric start so you ain't sitting there pulling your guts out on something with this kind of displacement um, what else we got on this one I set it up so I got a oil pressure sending unit and I've also got an oil temperature sending unit down below tapped into the oil uh, reservoir on it so that runs down to the two gauges here and then I just got one of those uh, tiny tacks for for the RPM that's it for instrumentation there's just not much to them this thing like I said starts out at 94 pounds stripping everything off of it it stripped well over 20 something pounds of dead weight off and that was including taking that flywheel off that weighs 22 pounds this this flywheel weighs I think it's uh, around 11 pounds and uh, time to put the reduction drive back on it and there was some other stuff stripped off it put it probably close to I haven't weighed this thing but the reduction drive weighs 14 pounds so by the time I stripped everything off of it put the reduction drive on them should be around 84 pounds on this thing um, and there again, it probably still needs to be weighed just to make sure. Um, you can see it's a pretty simple exhaust system. It's not like on a two cycle where you have to have it all tuned and everything. Just as long as you get enough blown out, you're you're good to go. Um, I've got a canister type too that I'm going to experiment around with and maybe drop it down low or set it up high uh, and see how that works. When I was doing initial experiments with this, um, I had the the big canister type. I also tapped in and put in a wide band oxygen sensor in it so that I could you know see what my rich lean was and you know got it to where it was you know right team at what 14.7 uh, to one for the 
air to fuel ratio so it was run real this thing just runs real nice real smooth uh no no heating problems at all uh, let's see what else we want? oh battery okay this is classical wet cell battery that uh, i was using it weighs actually i just weighed it with my official um uh, fish fish digital fish scale and it was 9.5 pounds okay so trying to lighten things up uh wix aircraft sells these little batteries here and they're a little solid state battery ballistic is who makes them i think they're like i think i paid like 100 bucks for this thing and being skeptical as i was as reading on the thing because it's Mm, if you can read that or not but it says something like on here that it's good for from a 50 cc to a 1800 cc engine um let's see somewhere on here it's got some equivalents maybe it's on the inside sorry about the bouncing around let's see what we got here it's around 15 I think is the milliamps equivalent uh, this one here is a 14 amp hour battery so they're real close in size but this battery here weighs one pound actually when they had one sitting there on the counter and I picked it up I thought it was just a display I didn't, you know with nothing in it and uh, they were like no that's what it weighs and I was like no way so I was like I snagged the thing up slapped it on here and thinking well it probably ain't gonna have much power to crank this thing but it actually seems to crank and hold a charge better than the the battery that i had in there and that's a regular motorcycle battery over there so that was a you know another we got eight and a half pound savings right there so between shaving all the armor plating off the engine and slapping that on there uh you know I've saved probably close to what almost 20 pounds off of what this thing was weighing or would have weighed but the whole goal of this was to get into a four cycle engine the other thing is rotax stopped making the 447 and the 503 so it leaves a huge hole in the market and you end up with uh the kawasaki engines which are you know fabulous engines but um you know no telling how long they'll keep those around because same might be the same reason as the, the rotax is they no longer use them in the snowmobiles and that so just not much market in in the way of ultralights and that um so let me go let's go over some simple math here i'll show you i don't know if you can see this or not i'll just point it at it and then tell you uh this is the service manual for the kohler engine and this one here is the ch740 it's listed at 27 horse at 3600 rpm the Compression ratio is 9 to 1, and you can see shipping weight on this is 94 pounds. Like I said, I don't know how well this camera pick up to, to read that. And let's see what we got for torque. Peak torque is 42.3 pounds, and that's at 2400 RPM. Um, that was another thing to try to keep this at around. 5,500 to 5,000 RPM for the maximum on this is so that you get that crossover at the magic 5252 number where your your horsepower and, and torque cross curves. Uh, so you end up kind of maximizing both those. You get real efficiency at that. Um, or the best compromise of efficiency. Let's see, we got fuel uh, consumption. Uh, went ahead and did the math on it. Uh, which is you know boring to pretty much everybody but I guess me uh, but it basically comes down to if you were doing 50 5300 rpm it should be a consumption around 3.4 gallons per hour uh, and then at 75 percent power which is 4000 rpm you're getting a 2.6 gallons per hour it's a little bit better than that and mainly that's just because this is you know the perfect math and the efficiency of an engine is not anywhere near that, so you're probably talking worst scenario is about two and a half gallons an hour, uh, you know, and that's that's at your cruise, um, and you might even find it's better than that. Uh, I've done that same thing with the 
with a biplane that I'd built and theoretically it should have been burning like seven and a half gallons an hour and it was burning somewhere between five and six and that was really putting it to it and aerobatics and all kinds of stuff so you can see the efficiency of the engine makes a big difference there and temperature outside and what you got to jet it at. Um, another thing is whenever you're experimenting around with engines especially for aircraft use you want to make sure the amount of fuel coming from your tank getting to your engine is sufficient. Uh, don't just think that you can run out and this this happened to me uh, where I went out and bought a fuel pump from one of these Volkswagen conversion guys and slapped it on that black airplane and found out it was at full throttle doing static test you know I literally was running out of gas uh, while I was at full throttle so trying to take off and you know do a climb out or something and run out of gas isn't the best thing to have happen to you so luckily I caught that and switched over to a totally different system actually I scrapped the whole engine and everything eBayed it and started from scratch and did what I knew to do um, simple calculation factor uh, ends up something like 1.06 is this magic factor they seem to keep coming up with is uh, what happens is what you want is 3.6 mils per second for 3.4 gallons per hour consumption so if you know what your engine is going should consume then you can actually convert that to mils or milliliters per second so if you're filling a little small graduated cylinder or you take uh, one of these kind of syringes you get for giving kids medicines and cut off the bottom of it uh, or pull out the plunger and actually fill that you can ca do a calculation and figure this out so you should end up about 1.6 mils per second times whatever the gallons per hour that you should have and as long as you get come up with that calculation you should be good to go on making sure you got enough fuel running up to the engine so you're not running out at full throttle um, let's see what else do we have this here was a Oh, it was a Falker Eindecker 3 that I designed and built. Um, probably getting a reflection off of the light overhead. And I had this engine in this aircraft. So I flew it two times, ended up selling the engine. I had a fully TIG welded frame there. Actually, the frame itself I displayed up there at uh, Air Venture in 2005 as a proof of concept for TIG welding uh, aluminum frames. And the whole frame weighed 32 pounds. Uh, with this engine, it was just it was just a monster. Um, like I said, I had flew it twice and ended up selling. Just the guy just wanted the the, the body only, so the way it went, I kept the engine. I ended up building the trike after that, and uh, it's it's been pretty pretty fun. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing on this. So basically, change carburetor, st strip off all the extra plating installed the reduction drive um, flywheel mags uh, a lot of wiring came off with that smart spark so that simplified the wiring system on it uh, just put a simple squeeze bulb off of a boat on there and I got a three and a half gallon tank but if you put a five gallon tank on there it'd be that much better um, and we changed out let's see exhaust not much more so it's staying pretty basic to it um, internal stock parts you know uh, I tore this thing down uh, looked at it nowhere uh, called Kohler to ask them you know hey what kind of life expectancy on these engines uh, they said they recommend no less than 2,000 hours on on no matter what the application before teardown they told me they had two engines one was uh, had been running for five years nonstop and another one been running for seven years nonstop I don't know what they were on there might have just been idling for all I know but you know that was what they claimed that and they do put these things on stump grinders and you know they, the zero radius mowers have these and those guys really put those things through the paces a lot of I've talked to some of them guys and they said well they're not getting that many hours out of them but then again they're you know getting full of grass and you know heating up pretty good because they're sitting right there at the ground level uh, you know as far as what we got you know we're compressing air you know and you're reducing the the mass of the flywheel because we basically got another flywheel back here um, another thing is chain tension you know uh, I've had people ask me you know well what about the pulse and the chain and stuff I don't I don't feel it uh, I've had 
belt drive on this exact same thing and was running belt drives. The reason I didn't like the belt drive is I had a situation where one of the belts started to fray and come apart and I wasn't even flying it or nothing. It was just strictly doing ground tests and stuff and static run-ups and that. So when you go to the more expensive belts, you know, you can get into 80 or 100 bucks real quick in a good belt. And it just, I don't know, I just didn't find it worth it. The alignment was good. Everything was fine. I was just, you know, maybe it was a bad belt. I don't know. But I didn't feel like trying to take off, you know, flying over a wooded area.